To our visitors, we say welcome to New York City and to Times Square Church. And we trust that you have experienced the presence of the Lord Jesus in the service this morning. It's the only purpose of our being here is to exalt Christ at the crossroads of the world <clears throat> right here in the middle of modern Babylon. And God has been faithful. Services uh, this afternoon at 3, entirely different service. <clears throat> And we have no repeat services, and then at 6 o'clock this evening, don't miss these meetings. <clears throat> now, folks, we're going to go back into the New Covenant today again. And uh, I'm going to ask you to pray with me that God will give you ears to hear what the Spirit has to say. I'm going to bring a message that if you will hear it, it will give you power in your life over sin as long as you live. This is the secret to the power over besetting sin. This is the secret to breaking the dominion of sin. There's no other way. There's no other gospel that, that can literally break the chains of sin and the dominion of Satan other than the new covenant. And we'll be talking about the delivering power of the new covenant. I want you to go to Exodus, the second chapter, if you will, please. Exodus 2. Now, folks, we're, we're going to go through a lot of Scripture today. Get your Bible handy. And folks, don't let your mind wander. If you will keep your mind focused and allow the Holy Spirit to take the Word, make it life to you, you'll see the change. Before you walk out of the service today, your life will be changed. Exodus, the second chapter, beginning to read at verse 23 through 25. Exodus, second chapter. And it came to pass in process of time that the king of Egypt died, and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage, and they cried, and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. And God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob, and looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect unto them. In other words, God said, I'm going to move now in covenant, and I'm going to deliver. He remembered his covenant. Heavenly Father, I come to you now for strength and for anointing and for clarity. Lord Jesus, we're living in very perilous times. And once again, a generation in bondage, a generation that knows very little of freedom, very little of truly walking in the Spirit of God. And I pray, Lord, that you touch me with fire from heaven. Lord, I know you gave me this word. You've been opening your covenant to me. And we pray now that we will enter into it, lay hold of it. Holy Spirit, quicken us. Let the power of the Holy Ghost come now. God, open our ears, open our eyes, and give us an understanding. Let me preach it, Lord, from the depths of, this, of the heart that you've given me to it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Came to pass, process of time, the king of Egypt died. This is the same king that Moses fled from 40 years before. And now a new king has arisen, and this new king has added to the bondage of Israel. He's taken away the straw, which means that they can't bind the bricks. The bricks crumble, so the lash of the taskmaster comes down harder than ever. And the people are driven to despair. The children and the wives are forced into slavery. They're wandering the countryside hither and yon, looking for grass and straw to bind the bricks, finding very little straw. The bricks are not produced as they ought to be, and so the taskmasters take it out on them, and they're beaten until they stagger home into their habitats, wounded and bruised and oppressed and depressed, and weeping and crying and sighing. And the Bible said their cry, their sigh came up to God. Israel sighed because of the bondage, and they cried out. And their cry because of their bondage rose up to God, so God heard their groaning. Now, folks, listen to me. These people had already labored for years under the same bondage. They had been sighing and crying for years. Why does God suddenly move? Why does God say enough? Why does God say the sigh finally comes up to him? Is it that God has forgotten them all these years? He's just ignored them? They were sighing and crying for many, many years. Bible says 
God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the word says God took notice of them. It doesn't mean that God forsook them all those years. It didn't mean that God suddenly, after hearing this sign and crying, said, oh, wait a minute, that's right. I made a covenant with Abraham, with Isaac and Jacob and all his seed. And these are, this is the seed, and I made covenant with them. And now I, 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 I'm sorry, children, I allowed you all this bondage these years because I forgot my covenant. That's not what it means at all. It says they forgot the covenant is what it means. And that God said, though you forget, I will not forget. He remembered it and that he did not forget what he promised to Abraham and his seed. Now remember the covenant was made with Abraham and to all of his seed. And Isaac and Jacob, the sons, the son and grandson of Abraham enjoyed the blessing of the covenant. Jacob applied to the covenant many times. He was delivered from his brother Esau by covenant. He was told to go down to Egypt by covenant. Joseph went down to Egypt to, to uh, work out a mighty deliverance, the Bible said, for the children of Israel. Now, you would say to me if you read the scripture, it, uh, God says, I will establish my covenant between me and you. He's speaking to Abraham. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants for an everlasting covenant to be a God to you and to your descendants after you. He made an ironclad oath. Abraham, I'm going to be your guide. I'm going to be your shield. I want you to be blameless before me, but I'm going to be your reward. I'm going to be God to you, and you're going to be a son to me. And he said, I make this to you, to all your children, as far as your seed lasts. That goes all the way to Christ and beyond Christ, because we are his seed. So these people were under covenant. These people were under covenant. God did not annul this covenant. They were a covenant people living under covenant. I, I mean, living under the promise of the covenant. How is it that they could live all of these hundreds of years in bondage, absolute bondage to slavery, having a covenant hidden to their eyes? It was theirs all the time. God did not annul it, annul it but they were laboring under absolute bondage to the taskmaster, enslaved. God never did intend that they live in bondage. He didn't send them down to Egypt to chastise them. He didn't send them down there to put them in bondage. I know the scripture says that God forewarned Abraham that there would be strangers in that land that's not theirs, meaning Egypt. And they'd be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. The Bible also says that in the fourth generation, or after 400 years, they will return, for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. This is God speaking in foreknowledge. It was not foreordained. It was the foreknowledge of God. God was seeing that there, they went down to Egypt. Jacob knew about the covenant. He walked in the covenant. He taught the children of Israel the covenant. I would hope for at least 70 years, one generation, they walked in some form of the covenant. Somehow the message dimmed. Somehow they got into idolatry. They got into the worship of idols. And this message was lost. They didn't lay hold of it. They didn't seek after it. They turned instead to their idols. In fact, God, the Bible said, sent Joseph down to keep Israel alive by a great deliverance. Stephen, in Acts 7.43, said, speaking of Israel, you also took along the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of the god Rompha, the image you made to worship them. Do you understand that the children of Israel came out of Egypt carrying those gods with them that they were worshiping in Egypt? All through those 40 years, the reason they were stubborn, the reason the covenant did not work for them, the reason they did not see the deliverance is because they never did get idol worship out of their heart. They never did get the world out of their system. Egypt was always in them and, and the idolatry of these gods they carried all through, according to Stephen. And even now in the passage that we're considering here now, these enslaved people of God don't know anything about the covenant promises now. They don't know that God said, I'll be a shield to you from all your enemies. 
They'll not be able to enslave you. You're going to be able to walk in freedom. If you just walk blameless before me, be dependent upon me, trust in me. You will not be enslaved. You will live in freedom and you will walk in victory. But they were not in victory. They were enslaved, even though the covenant was there for their taking all the time. They didn't ask about the covenant. Its truth had been open to them years before, but its message is now dimmed. The word of God has been neglected and they turned to self-gratification, even though they were still under covenant. Abraham's part of the covenant, you remember, was simply to walk blameless before the Lord. In fact, he said that's the same uh, obligation of all the seed. I will be a God to you. I'll protect you. I'll be your shield. But your part of the covenant is to walk blameless before me in total obedience. They'd forgotten this. They'd forgotten their pledge. But God said, you may forget, but I have not forgotten. And God, in an act of grace and mercy, moved suddenly in covenant. God delivered Israel because he made a covenant with Abraham, not because they were a good people. The Bible said, God said, you were the fewest. I didn't choose you. I, have, I am delivering you because I made a promise to Abraham. I am delivering you because I'm a man of my word. I am a God that keeps my promises. I keep my covenant. And they were delivered by the power of the covenant. He said, I've come down to deliver thee from the power of the Egyptians to bring you from that land of bondage to a good land. I've come down now to deliver you from the power of sin, is what he's saying. I have come now. He took it out of their hands. He took it into his own hands. It was now God's responsibility to deliver them. They could not deliver themselves. Totally impossible. They would have never been delivered if God had not moved in covenant. Suddenly, I made an agreement. I will stick by it. I'm going to deliver. You're not worthy. You're, you're stiff-necked. You have idolatry, but I made a promise and I'm going to deliver because of my promise. These people were helpless without strength, but God all along had been preparing a deliverer. He had a man in a mountain. He had a man in preparation. Hallelujah. Moses was God's deliverer for his people. Now, let's come to this present day. I said that to tell you that there was a covenant that was neglected for at least 330 years. If you give one generation heeding Jacob's first teaching, perhaps on the covenant and how he had walked and lived in the power of the covenant, I would hope at least one generation stayed with the covenant. So there were at least 330, 350 years that they walked in ignorance of the wonderful blessing of God. They could have been delivered, but God in his foreknowledge saw that they would never seek after the covenant. And I'm going to show you how that's happened again under a new covenant. <clears throat> now, this brings me to this present generation. Let's talk about your time and my time. Once again, a time of bondage. When people are living under terrible bondages to sin. People who can't find freedom, who sin confess, sin confess all their lifetime, never truly living free from a besetting sin, never really believing that there's a place of freedom. Now this cry for deliverance that came out of Egypt came out of maybe no more than three million people. And it came from a little piece of territory in Egypt called Goshen. And here out of the whole face of the globe, there's, there are maybe three million people out of the millions and millions of people on earth. And it's in a little section called Goshen, a little parcel of territory on the face of the globe. And there's a cry coming up. But not so today, folks. It's not one little parcel of ground. It's not just three million people. Multitude of millions of Christians, believers all over the world who are crying for deliverance from the power of sin. Because Satan's come down to this earth having great wrath, knowing his time is short. And he comes now with new inventions, new devices that our fathers never knew. The children of Ephesus knew, never ever could conceive the kind of exotic devices the devil uses to trap and enslave God's people today in sin. I heard an expert, uh, an expert on computers and internet 
And he said he actually believes that 90% of the use of the internet now is pornography. 90%. Weapons the devil uses that the Egyptians and our fathers never even conceived. And like Israel and Egypt, we have Christians that continue year after year, slaved in sin, enslaved and bound, driven by lust. And lust becomes their taskmaster. They're ready to collapse under the lash of a tormentor. Their cry is, oh Lord, am I never going to be free? What do I have to do to get rid of these chains? I've prayed, I've fasted, I've poured into the word of God and I still can't get free. And so some people settle down as if that there, there is no freedom and all your life is serving Christ is one of absolute struggle. Occasional victory, but always defeated, always giving into temptation. No real freedom, no real joy, no breaking of the dominion of the power of sin. And consequently, many get angry at God and they give themselves over to their pleasures and their lusts because they said, I tried, I prayed, I fasted, and everybody told me the power of the Holy Ghost would be there, but I never found it. And so they go their way in despair, giving themselves over to their iniquities. Folks, God foresaw these wicked days of apostasy and overwhelming lust. But I want you to know that he made a plan. He gave a plan. There was a covenant made for full redemption from the power and dominion of sin. A covenant was made that guarantees that God's people are not going to go out in the last days as slaves. They're not going to spend their lifetime in Egypt. God made a covenant. Now every child of God on the face of the earth has available to him the power of the new covenant. And we want to talk about it now. In the new covenant, God took an oath. He swore by himself because if you're going to swear you swear on the Bible because it's more truthful than you are. You have to find a power greater than you and because God couldn't find anybody greater or more truthful than themselves, he swore by himself. He said, I make a promise. I make an oath because there's nobody greater than I am. I swear by myself. That's all he needed. A new covenant that my people will live free from the dominion of sin by a new living way on better promises. You see, the old covenant was on your promise and mine. The children of Israel heard the law and they said, we will obey. Lord said the new covenant's on better promises because they're not ours, they're his. God himself initiated this everlasting covenant. He came to mankind by grace and mercy alone. He saw us sinking in despair. He saw that we, had, we, had, we were no match for the devil in this battle for, against lust and sin. He said, I am going to absolutely guarantee and I will make an oath. I will make provision that all my people can obey me and never turn away from me again. Now that's some... you. You've already been blown away. You said impossible. I'm not preaching eternal security, and you'll see that in just a moment. Now, if that sounds too good to you, go with me to Jeremiah 32, please. We preach the word here. Amen. Jeremiah 32. Uh, somewhere along this line, this, is, this truth is going to hit you like thunder. Let's start at verse 38. Jeremiah 32, start at verse 38. In the annex, are you folks with me? You better have your Bible. Verse 38, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, and I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever. 
For how long? Forever. And for the good of them. Now, who's making these promises? God says, I will. These are the better promises, not by man to him, but God to us. I, I will give them one heart, one way that they may fear me forever for the good of them and of the children after them, of their children after them. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them, agreement that I will not turn away from them to do, to do them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. You can't work up the fear of God. God says, I will put my fear in your hearts that you will not turn away from me. That's God. That is his covenant to you and to me as believers. Listen to it. I will put my fear in you. I'll make an everlasting agreement with you that I'll never turn away from doing you good. I'll put my fear in you that you shall never depart from me. I am going to do you good. The new covenant is nothing but the goodness of God. It gets better in Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36. Now I hear the rustling of the leaves, please. Let's start with verse 25, Ezekiel 36, verse 25. Are you there? <laughs> then will I sprinkle clean water upon you. You shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart will also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart of your flesh and I'll give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues and you shall keep my judgments and do them. God said, you're going to keep my commandments. You're going to keep my law, not in your own strength, but I'm going to give you my spirit and my spirit will enable you to fulfill everything that brings to you to obedience. The new covenant demands perfect obedience. You can't do it on your own, only through the power of the Holy Ghost. He said, I'll put my spirit in you. Glory be to God. You say, but Brother Dave, that, that, that's just for Israel. It says for the house of Israel. <laughs> because it, it says, I'll take you out from among the heathen and bring you into your own land. Do you know what that old land? God, how many of you have been brought out from among the heathen? How many of you have been brought into the good land? The land of faith. That's exactly what it is to the fullness of Christ. Do I have to go over again? What we've been teaching you about two Israels, there's an Israel of the flesh and there's an Israel of the spirit. There's an Israel of God. And we are the Israel of God. Those of us who trust in the cross of Jesus Christ, that there are two kinds of Jews. There's a natural Jew who is not really, really the seed of Abraham because of their unbelief. The scripture makes it very, very clear that Know you therefore that they who are of faith, they are the children of Abraham, those who are of faith. He's not a Jew who's one physically, the Bible said. He's one who's one spiritually, who's been circumcised, not with hands, but by the Spirit of God. Do we have to go over that? We know that, don't we? This is for the true Israel. This is for us. These promises are not for an unconverted Jewish nation. It is for the Jerusalem, which is from above, the true Israel of faith. Hallelujah. You are a Jew by faith. You are a Zionian by faith. Now this new covenant is a New Testament truth. Even though God blessed Jeremiah to first announce it. And you'll find that in Jeremiah 31. You can go into th that later on. But I want to take you into the New Testament to Hebrews the 8th chapter. And we'll see the new covenant laid out before us. Now, if you came this morning just to have your ears tickled, you're going to be disappointed. If you came here to have truth that will set you free, then plow along with me. Hebrews, the eighth chapter.
Folks, how long has this truth been in the Bible? Since it's been penned. It's been there all the time. But it's been neglected. It's been ignored. Eighth chapter. Starting with verse six, please. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, speaking of Christ, by how much more also he's the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Folks, we are the house of Israel by faith. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind, and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. They shall not teach every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for you shall know, all shall know me from the least to the greatest. I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities while I remember no more. And in that he saith, the new covenant he made hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish. Hallelujah. Now I want you to <clears throat> follow me please very closely. This is the covenant that I have made with the house of Israel that true seed of Abraham, those who walk by faith. In this covenant, God pledges the following. He swears he's going to write the law in our hearts and minds. He took an oath that we're, he's going to be God to us. We will always be his people. He promises that he will, we will know him in all his ways. We would be taught his ways by the Holy Spirit. And fourthly, he would make an everlasting contract to be merciful to our unrighteousness. He will forget all of our sins and forgive them and forget them. That's, th those are the pledges of the new covenant. Now, a covenant is made between two parties. But listen to me, please. Both of those parties have to be trustworthy, dependable, and able to keep the promises. They have to have the resources to keep these promises. Now, how can God make covenant with us? He made covenant with Christ. We, we, our, our word is worthless. We have no resources we are not a good covenant partner. There's no way. We are in covenant only because we're in Christ. Because your word and mine doesn't mean anything. It's worthless. Let me try to explain. The children of Israel promised, oh yes, we'll keep your commandments. So we will do it. Their word was worthless. They broke it within days. And this is why God sent his son. He sent him to be mediator of this agreement because he was the only one worthy. He's the only one that had resources. We can't keep the commandments to obey God. We can't keep them in our human strength and our human ability. Our promises are absolutely worthless. If I had a house for sale, let me try to explain. If I had a house for sale, I would never make a contract with a penniless man. I don't care how much he said, I will do my best to pay you. I would say to this man, look, if you really want my house, let's say it's $100,000. Go get a cosigner. And, and I'll tell you, I'm not going to accept a cosigner that he brings. He says, I found a cosigner. He's got a house that's worth $75,000. I said, I need $100,000. I'm not taking anything less, and you have to have a co-signer that has the resources to back this up so that when I sign this contract, I've got somebody co-signed who's got the word and the resources to see that I'm paid. I'll give you another example. Suppose you needed a million dollars or you go to jail. You've got to get a loan. You need money bad, so you go to a bank that you've heard is very lenient. And you go to the loan arranger, and you say, sir, you sit there and say, do you give million dollar loans? He said, oh yes, sure do. Good, I need a million dollar now. I'm quick, I need help. I need a million dollars. 
So he's fine. He pulls out an application form. And he says, all right, let's start listing your assets. How, how much money do you have in the bank? Uh, how many homes do you own? Uh, and what are your liabilities? And how do you expect to pay this back? And you say, well, well, well I'll tell you what. Truthfully, I don't have any assets. <laughs> truthfully, I'm unemployed. <laughs> but I tell you, I'm a man of my word. You ask my wife, I'm a man of my word. <laughs> and I, 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 and he, he sees the front. I, he said, I'll tell you what, I'll work it out. I'll scrub floors. I'll do all the bank windows. I'll work my fingers to the bone. Now I'll tell you what, I'll make sure I don't get in trouble. I won't smoke. I won't drink. I won't commit adultery. I won't watch pornography so no cop can come get me in jail so you can't get your money. I'll work, work, work until it's paid. What chance do you think you're going to get that money? As much chance as you've got of keeping your word to God that you'll be holy. You need a cosigner. You need a rich cosigner because your debt is beyond your comprehension. You know what the purpose of the old covenant was? Simply to show you how bankrupt you are. The old covenant is, God will let you stay under the law until you quit going around and trying to work angles and say, I'm going to work for this, I'm going to do it. And you make promises, you do everything until you finally run out of banks. You finally run out of effort. You finally sweat yourself till there's no more sweat. You've made promise after promise and every promise you've made has failed. And that's the purpose of the new covenant. It has accomplished its intended purpose. When you finally sit back and say, I'm dead. I, I can't do it. I'm, I'm empty. I'm dry. My word is no good. I sin, confess. I've made God a million promises and broke every one of them. I need a sponsor. I need a co-signer. I need a surety. Let me show you the heart of the new covenant if I can. God made an incredible agreement with his son. See, the covenant was made with Christ. And then to us only as we're in him. I hope this is language you're not going to understand. God made a covenant with his own son Christ because he saw that we were totally incapable of dealing with the dominion of sin. And if God didn't move, he would have lost all of creation. He would have lost mankind. He made an agreement. He foresaw this. He knew it. And he would send his own son. <clears throat> and he came when man was without strength. This was the purpose of the old covenant, to bring to man to a place where he acknowledged he's without strength. And the Bible said when we were without strength, Christ died. That's when the new covenant was initiated, was ratified at the cross, was initiated at the birth of Jesus Christ. God made an agreement. He said, I will endue you with my spirit. And I'm going to give you my spirit without measure. Now, Jesus, secondly, was to come as a pattern man of the secret of the new covenant and the power so that man could see in Christ that the covenant has the power. Jesus did not live a sinless life on the power of humanity. He lived a sinless life on the power of the Holy Spirit that was given to him without measure. It was the Spirit of God that was in him. The prophet Jeremiah and Ezekiel both said the same thing, and I'll show it to you in just a minute. It's very, very clear in the Scripture that Jesus Christ was the pattern man so that all of us would realize that we have no chance. We have to come into the covenant. We have to believe that the Holy Spirit given by God is the secret of our power. The Bible, in this arrangement with Christ, God made with Christ that Jesus would gather all of those who would be in the covenant and the Father would give Christ, listen to this now, the Father is going to give Jesus access to all of his wealth. Now, I want to show you something that is so mind-boggling when I saw it, I, it just overwhelmed me. It is, I still don't comprehend it. It's so incredible what God has done. And if you'll see this, you'll see how far God has gone to keep you. You'll see to what extent God loves you and how he intends to keep you by his power from the clutches of the devil. And if you can see this now, I'm getting now to the heart of the covenant. Listen, 
You had to have a sponsor. You had to have an assurance. You know, the Bible calls it a surety. So much more, Jesus has become the surety or the guarantee or the sponsor, the co-signer of a better covenant. That's Hebrews 7, 22. Jesus has become the surety, the co-signer. You know how that happened? Jesus looked at you and I in our poverty. We had nothing to pay. First of all, Jesus would pay all our past debts and past sins. Well, what about our future sins? We're going to need a co-sponsor because the bill's going to come due for all our present sins and future sins. Who's going to pay them? Ha, ha, ha. You say, well, the blood does it. Yes, but there has to be power because I want to live in joy. I want to live in victory. I don't want to live all my lifetime in fear. I don't want to live in guilt and condemnation. So God sees we need a rich sponsor, a rich co-signer. So what did God do? He gave him all his wealth. He made him incomprehensible wealthy. He made him wealthy in wisdom and grace and power, everything that man would ever need to live an overcoming life. He filled him with his Holy Spirit without measure. He made our co-signer rich so that he could be our co-signer. Think about it. God so loved you, you didn't, you didn't make an oath to God. You didn't go and get your own co-signer. God went out and got your co-signer for you. And he had to be rich. He had to be able to pay any debt that you couldn't pay because when you don't pay, the co-signer's responsible to pay. So he got you your own co-signer. So that when you ran out and everything was due, and the Heavenly Father and His justice have every right to call you in on the debt. The co-signer is notified and the co-signer says, I'll pay it. It's even more incomprehensible than that. My co-signer has left this earth. He went with all his wealth back to the Father. He ascended to heaven. He's in glory now. And here I am and still in my weakness and poverty. Oh, but there was another agreement made. Hallelujah. The Lord says, I'm going to send an attorney. Can you imagine a live-in attorney, full-time live-in attorney? The Lord said, the same Holy Ghost that raised me from the dead, the same Holy Spirit that kept me in sinless perfection, I am going to send him to you and he's going to abide in you. And you know what he's going to do? Oh, oh, f folks, you don't believe that? I want you to listen. Please go with me to Isaiah 59, please. Isaiah 59, and let's nail it down. This, this is so incredible if you just ask, oh, Holy Ghost, make me see this. God, let me understand what you, how, how much you love me and what you've done in the new covenant. Look at verse 20 and 21, Isaiah 59. And the Redeemer, that's Christ, shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression, and Jacob saith the Lord, as for me, this is the Father speaking, as for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. My spirit which is upon thee, in other words, the same spirit that's on my son Jesus, my words which I put in thy mouth, he's speaking to Christ, the very spirit I put on you, the words I've given to you, shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, seed saith the Lord from henceforth and forever. The same spirit. You know what Jesus said? This attorney would do when he came to abide in you. He will guide you into all truth. He will speak whatever Christ tells him to speak, in other words. Secondly, he will show you things to come. I used to think that was prophecy. 
No, he will show you things to come that were promised that we can't even comprehend. Things that are in the covenant. He will show you things to come. Keeping power, wisdom, might, glory of God. <laughs> Forgive me for getting so excited. <laughs> Bible, Jesus said he will glorify me. And how does he do that? By showing us what's available to us in Christ. He shall receive of mine. He's going to show it to you. John 16, 14. He will deliver to us all that the Father has given to him. He said, all things that the Father has made, given me. He said, God made me rich on your account. He's going to take what he's given to me. He's going to show it or give it to you. The Holy Ghost distributes the gifts and the glory and the power of Jesus Christ, for in him is the victory. Do you know what it means when the new covenant says, God said, I'm going to write my laws in your heart? He puts the lawgiver there. Himself. It was the Holy Ghost, the finger of the Holy Ghost who wrote the law. It was the Holy Ghost who inspired. He was there all the time. It's the Holy Ghost that comes. I, I used to struggle with this. What, what does it mean, the law written on my heart and, and, and all that? It's the Holy Ghost abiding, who is the lawgiver. He is there. He knows the mind of God. He knows the mind of Christ and all the things of Christ that he abides and all of this is fulfilled in that he comes and distributes so that when I need power, when I need strength, I go to the Lord in prayer and I say, Lord, I, I'm about to fail. I need help. Holy Ghost, come now. The Holy Ghost distributes all the power and the wisdom and the glory that is in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. He said, it'll be there. If you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. <sighs> Can you understand this, the glory, absolute glory of God saying, I'm not, I am so determined to keep you from falling. I'm so determined to deliver you. I'm going to make it an incredible offer. I'm going to make an oath to you. That even if you should fail, I'm providing your co-signer. I've made him rich in your behalf. And all that you need is there. And the only reason we don't live in victory today, we can't believe it. We can't lay hold of it. We, won't, we can't conceive that God could so love us that he would make such incredible provision. Folks, it's all by faith. It's all seeing it and stepping out on faith and believing with everything that is in you. Hallelujah. This covenant was meant to build up our faith so that we could overcome all the powers of hell. I, I hear people say, well, praise God, get me into the covenant right now. If this is all true, I want in it. Folks, listen to me. This covenant is only for sin sick souls. It is only for those who have so loathed their sins. It's been those who have struggled so long and God has seen that struggle. And God says, I'm going to make a way for you now. I am going to come to you in your struggle. Just like he came to Egypt when they were sighing and crying and sent a deliverer. He has sent us a deliverer, hallelujah. Our deliverer's in glory, but he sent his attorney who abides and lives forever in our hearts to distribute and, and to, to bring to Christ the mediator. Oh. Hallelujah. It's only for those sin sick souls who are looking for a way to obey God. They have a hunger and thirst for righteousness. This covenant is only an enabler for those who say, I want to obey God. I want to walk in righteousness. I want to walk in holiness and I don't have no how. I've been reaching for the power for years. I've been struggling to find that power. I want to walk a sinless life before God. I want to walk holy and righteous before God. And God says, you'll do it by covenant. The covenant is only for sin sick souls. Why would God want to put a new heart in a man who doesn't want it? Why would God write his laws in somebody's heart not willing to obey them? This is for those who want to obey God and have been hungering and thirsting and crying. Folks, that's been my cry all my life only to please him and to walk in his righteousness. And if that's your cry, God's going to hear that sighing and crying and he's going to come remember his covenant and deliver you. Yeah. 
He said, I'll be merciful to your sins. But why would he be merciful to those who have no intention of departing from their sins? He said, and with this, I'm going to close today. Pastor Dave, this is such an incredible thought, a truth. It's a secret to living an overcoming life. Then why has it been hidden all these years? Why, isn't, why aren't people, why aren't ministers preaching it? Why is it hidden? Folks, I started seeking the covenant when I was 28 years old. And the theme of my, my whole ministry has been from Psalm 25. The secret of the Lord is unfear fear him and the Lord will show him his covenant. And I, I, I said, Lord, why is it that after all these years it's taken me now over 40 years and it's been laying there. Folks, you understand that truth is there just as the children of Israel. Why, why was it that almost 350 years the covenant, the old covenant lay dead? The Abrahamic covenant lay dead and unclaimed when it was there with all of its power all the time. Same with the new covenant. The new covenant was understood by the Puritans. There's not a Puritan father, one of those God, all those godly Puritan fathers. I could list names of them. I don't want to do it unless you fear I'm trying to impress you with my knowledge. I don't have much knowledge, but I, I do study the Puritans. And they had this covenant. This is 330 years ago. And this, the Scottish divines, they, they preached it. But what happened to the preaching of the new covenant over the years, it, it became uh, a vehicle for lawlessness. They, they took it, well, well, I've got attorney, he's going to pay this price so I can live as I please. And it led to antinomianism or lawlessness. And so God just let it die because it had been so abused. But folks, the Bible makes it clear. Isaiah 56, 4, now take hold of my covenant. In Isaiah 56, 5 and 6, I will give an everlasting name that they shall not be cut off. Everyone that taketh hold of my covenant, everyone that taketh hold of my covenant. Look at me, please. This has been laying dead because of our own sinfulness in the last few centuries. We've become more and more of a wicked society all along. Every man doing his own thing. Folks, this covenant has been here all these years. But there comes a time when God says, you've forgotten it. But unless I remember the covenant, unless I act on the covenant, there is no hope. God is again in this last day. The, oh, this, this revelation came, this promise came now to Israel at the point of deliverance when God says the hour of deliverance has come. Folks, we're, this clo we're so close to the coming of the Lord. Listen to me, please. What I tell you now is prophetic and I believe with all my heart. I believe that God is going to open the new covenant this is going to be the one message of the last days that sets men free from the power of sin because the power of sin is going to get so incredibly powerful. There's going to be wickedness beyond anything we know even today. And God has to bring forth truth. Only truth can stand against this onslaught of the devil. Folks, if I stand and just berate sin, if I try to just get you down here to cry and weep for two hours because I have beaten you down with the message of conviction, you can get up and walk out and last for three weeks. But if you get this truth in your heart that God has made me a promise, not mine to him, but his to me, God has made me a promise. And I'm going to stand before the devil and all, the, all of the demons of hell and shall I stand here now though my house be not what it should be God has made me an everlasting covenant that's sure <laughs> this is the one thing the devil doesn't want you to know you're going to hear more and more of it not just from this pulpit but I believe God's going to speak to godly men all over this earth in this last day, and he's going to bring forth the word. Hallelujah. God has remembered his covenant. He's never forgotten it. He's going to move now. Hallelujah. Do you understand? Are you beginning to understand now how much God loves you? Do you understand now that all that God wants out of you and me is, is to loathe our sin? 
to have a hunger and thirst for righteousness and to say, I want to walk pleasing before God. And in that struggle, he'll come down with his truth and his power. And thank God for the Holy Ghost. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. That's why I don't understand who people, people just want the Holy Ghost to tickle them. They just want the Holy Ghost to knock them down. I don't want the Holy Ghost to just knock me down and tickle me. I want the Holy Ghost to deliver and distribute to me all the power of Jesus Christ in my life. Hallelujah.